I don't want to mess anything up over here. So just to uh, clarify in the announcements, the new members orientation is at 2 o'clock. Amen? And that's going to be awesome. Open for everybody to come. Uh, but today's lesson is entitled Spiritual Blindness. Spiritual Blindness. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 9. Come on, bro. I've been reading the book of John in my quiet times. You know, disciples, we have awesome quiet times. Amen. Life changing times with God every morning before we go to work. Amen. Before we go to school, you wouldn't go to battle without your armor on. We don't go to work or school without having had time with God. Spiritual blindness. You know, there's a theme in the book of John that I found is that God is, Jesus was always outdoors. And, uh, you know, Israel at the time was a desert. It still is just like where we live. And it gets a little hot. And I realized on Wednesday, I was reminded where we live. I was like, oh, welcome to Riverside. You know what I mean? Welcome to the IE. He was constantly outside and he was always with people. You know, sometimes, you know, for some of us, we like to be with people. When we're with people, we get energized, don't we? We're extroverted and it feeds our energetic spirit with like the more people, the better. We're the type of people that like to go to the party and, and we'll get in front of the crowd and we'll bust a move. You know what I mean? For some of you older folks, we'll cut a rug. You know what I'm talking about right there? And, and we're, we, we just love the energy of people. But for others of us, being around a lot of people is draining. And, and we would prefer to just be at home on the porch with a cup of coffee and, uh, and a Snuggie with, you know, a book. You know. And, and, and there's two, two types of personalities. Some of us are extroverted. Yeah! <laughs> Some of us are introverted. <laughs> you don't know what to, <laughs> you don't know what to do. Should you should you clap? Should you say woo? Be kind of a paradox. You know what's interesting is that Jesus could relate to anybody. Jesus could totally relate to the extroverted people or the introverted people. You know, some people are rational. Yeah. Yeah, that's like the rational people are like, yeah, that's true. <laughs> They, they have no feeling about what I'm saying right now. They're actually processing the information. And then we've got some emotional people. <laughs> some really emotional people, amen. Uh, <laughs> and Jesus could relate to anybody, but Jesus is with the people. And sometimes being with the people can be draining. Sometimes being with people is hard because you know when you give your heart to somebody, at some point, your heart's going to hurt for them. Yeah. You know? In the kingdom of God, you know, we belong to the, the sold out discipling movement. We belong to the kingdom of God. And there's, there's one constant in the movement, and it's that the movement moves. Yeah. And people move. And relationships are built, and then relationships sometimes are torn apart. Uh, but what's incredible about the kingdom is that no matter where you are on the globe, you can find family. Yeah, sure. And even though uh, people do move, and because we're, we're all about evangelizing the world, we still have very deep relationships with even people that are on the other side of the earth. Amen? Yeah. Here, John, you know, Jesus is, is outside. He's with the people. It says in verse 1, as he went along. So he continued to work. And you know, when you've worked and you've poured it out, it's hard to keep going. And you get tired. And you know, just this past Monday, I went to uh, MMA. I went to the gym. I, I was doing some jujitsu with some of the guys. And uh, I'm not classically trained in jujitsu. It was only my second time. And uh, there was a guy on top of me. We were what's called rolling. We were grappling and wrestling. And he was on top of me. My chest kind of compressed. And then I felt a, a pop inside of my rib cage. And I didn't know what it was. I just knew something was wrong. But I kept on wrestling for about a half an hour after that. And then by the time I got to my third partner, my sparring partner, I knew, okay, there's something seriously wrong. So I don't know. You can pray for me if it's cracked, broken, fractured, bruised, dislocated. There's something wrong. You know what I mean? And sometimes that can happen to us spiritually. You're in a wrestling match and you're fighting and you're training and, you, and you're excited about it. But then all of a sudden you hear a pop and it takes you out and it slows you down and it gets you tired. Are you tired this morning? No. I am. Amen. <laughs> yeah. 
it's okay to be tired, but we've got to rely on the Holy Spirit. I think God is just saying, hey, Jared, slow your roll. You need to rely on me. So I'm going to dislocate your rib so that you don't forget. But Jesus surely had some spiritual ribs that were displaced here, but it says he went along. He kept going. He didn't quit. And Jesus never quit. Jesus never gave up. Or the church said, yeah, Jesus, he just kept on persevering. And it's perseverance only when it gets hard. It's not perseverance when it's easy. That's not perseverance. That's just a good, it's just a good day. It's when it's a bad day that you've got to decide to stay the course. You know, he goes along and it says he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? This is very interesting. You've got to understand a little bit of the Jewish mindset of the day. If you were a Jew in the first century, you believed, according to your theology, that if somebody was sick, if somebody had met financial ruin, if somebody was having not a bad day, but a bad decade, you had one of those? Yeah. <laughs> when you're in your 20s, I had a bad day. When you're in your 30s, I had a bad week. You get to your 40s, like I had a bad decade. <laughs> yeah, the 90s. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> And, and, they're, and they're wondering, well, who sinned? Because somebody had to sin. He was born blind. He, I don't know how he would have sinned. He wasn't born yet. Well, it was most likely his parents that sinned. The first point, ignorance. Spiritual blindness. One way to be spiritually blind is to be ignorant, to lack knowledge. Amen. Amen. And then Jesus says in verse 3, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him. Wash in the pool of Shalom. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home saying, ignorance can blind you to the spiritual reality of the day. You know, the Bible says in Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 that people perish because of a lack of knowledge. Job 36, turn there with me, if you will. Verse 12. My people perish because of a lack of knowledge. Job 36. Verse 11. If they obey and serve him, him being God, they'll spend the rest of their days in prosperity. You see, this is why the Jews were confused. Because they're saying, if you obey, you'll be prosperous. And their years in contentment. But if they do not listen, they will perish by the sword and die without knowledge. You know, the, the apostles were blind because they really didn't understand the word of God. They're looking at this guy who's suffering and they're thinking, well, he did something wrong or his parents did something wrong. And can't we be like that? We see somebody out on the street and we automatically assume, well, they probably chose to be there. Wow. They probably did something to find themselves in that situation. Yeah. And we can very quickly start to try to identify what the sin is or who sinned or how it happened. Instead of understanding the reality of the situation is that God wants to be glorified. And there's a very basic biblical teaching that I want us to take away from this point. And I say basic because it's foundational. But it's for the mature. Amen? Amen? It's not for those that don't want to know the scriptures and that don't want to really discern God's will for them and their lives. It's for the mature, but it is basic because it's foundational. If you understand this, this principle, if you understand this conviction, you'll be able to understand anything that goes on in your life, good or bad. And that's that God is totally sovereign. What does that mean? Come on. Everything that happens in your life, God has allowed it to happen or he makes it happen. Yes. Everything that happens in your life, God has allowed it to happen or he made it happen. Amen. Yes. And he wants to see how you're going to respond. Yes. 
So the good things that happen, God's testing your heart. Amen. The bad things that happen, God's testing your heart. The ugly things that happen, God's testing your heart. Amen. And the apostles, they couldn't quite grasp this concept. And Jesus says, listen, nobody sinned. And that's good news, right? Wouldn't that be encouraging if you were involved in that conversation and Jesus talking about you? He's like, he didn't sin, guys. But this happened so that the work of God may be displayed in your life. And in every Bible talk in the IE region, the work of God must be displayed. Amen? And it will be as long as we're totally committed to one another. Proverbs verse 20, chapter 29, verse 20, excuse me, chapter 29, verse 18. Turn there if you will. It says in verse 18, where there's no revelation, the people cast off restraint. You know, the King James says where there's no vision, the people perish. This is revelation. There's, there's something that was otherwise left unknown that has now been made known. Now you know. You didn't know, and now you know. There's been a revelation in your life, and what this does is it keeps you under restraint. When there's no revelation, you cast off restraint. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ, you are under some restraints, aren't you? Yeah. In the world, you're a slave to sin, but in the kingdom, you're a slave to righteousness. You're totally under the restraint of lordship because when you got baptized, you said, Jesus is Lord. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And you subjected yourself to Jesus being your ruler and being your master, but you did so willingly because you got tired of your old master, your sin. Amen. So you willfully subjected yourself to Jesus being king. And that doesn't mean that everything is going to be hunky-dory. That just means when things are bad, when things are good, and even when things are ugly, you can still proclaim that Jesus is Lord. But we've got to be learners. We need to have a revelation in the scriptures every single day. If you don't, ultimately, obeying the Bible will become too burdensome for you. Are you with me? The restraint will become too tight and you'll begin to cast off the restraint for your desire for freedom. The problem is you cast off the restraint that God has on your life, the restraints of purity, the restraints of self-control, the restraints of sacrifice, the restraints of controlling your emotions, the restraints of evangelizing and the obligation that comes with your faith in Jesus Christ. You'll cast off that restraint thinking you're going to freedom them, but in reality, you're going right back to the chains that enslaved you before you became a disciple. You need to have a revelation. We can't be ignorant as the people of God. We need to know what God's will for us is. Amen. You know, in John chapter six, he says that nobody can come to Jesus unless the father draws him. Think back to your conversion. It was just in the nick of time, wasn't it? Yeah. When things in your life got darker and darker and things were getting worse and worse, God came right at the perfect time. Yeah. And by the skin of your teeth, you became a disciple. Amen. And I was in Florida, and let me tell you something, my life was going nowhere good. I mean, I was in Florida, that should, that should tell you enough. And Florida, it wasn't Miami, amen? <laughs> It was a different part of Florida, the part you haven't seen. And it was just getting darker and darker and darker. And my parents were moving to California because they wanted to join the movement. They wanted to be sold out disciples. And they invited me to come. But initially, I said no. But God moved in a mysterious way and, and enough so that the scales tipped and I agreed to go. And then they invited me to church. And I was like, okay. Sure, I'll go to church. I knew inside that I was finally being faced with the one thing I'd been running from for, for a long, long time. And I, I, I was new to California. I'd been there for three or four days. And I was uh, involved in drugs. And I, and I thought, well, I don't know anybody that has any any drugs, so I guess I just got to get drunk. So the night before I started studying the Bible, I drank six beers and a quart of scotch. And then in that state, went back to the store and got more, and then it kind of just became 
a blur after that. I show up the next day to my Bible study, my Seeking God study, and the guy's talking about his life, and he says, yeah, when I was in school, you know, I used to, you know, I used to get drunk, and I'm thinking, oh, he, he smells it. That's why he's bringing it up. But I was so convicted in that moment that as he's talking, I said, I got drunk last night. And he was like, oh, well, do you want to study the Bible? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> And we started studying the Bible, and then three weeks later, I became a disciple and I was baptized. Amen? And why did I need to get drunk? Because my life was in shambles. It was a mess. And by the grace of God, because those disciples had the courage to show me the scriptures, I understood that really I was searching for God, but in all the wrong places. And I thought that, man, if I can just keep going to these empty wells, somehow I'll feel better about my situation. I was, I was numbing out. I was escaping. And if it wasn't drugs or alcohol, it was impurity, immorality. If it wasn't that, it was food. It was laziness. It was just any way to make myself feel a little bit better about the dire situation that I'd found myself in. You see, sin takes you further than you wanted to go. And my sin had taken me far enough to a place where I realized, man, I really need some help. I really need God. One way to not be ignorant is to ask questions. Amen? All of us are lacking in one area or another. We got to ask questions. We need to know about the movement. Amen? Today at the New Members Orientation, we're going to talk all about the movement. We're going to talk about leadership. We're going to talk about the Crown of Thorns Council. When I got baptized, I was the first baptism in L.A. And it was just 50 people in the movement. I mean, it was crazy. 42 disciples had come from Portland, and, and that's what I was converted into. That's the story. You got to know your story. You've got to know where you come from. I mean, you got to learn how to have better quiet times. Amen. Learn what book to read and, and, and how to read it. Amen. What I do is interactive study. So if you look uh, in my Bible here, uh, for example, I studied the book of Mark and I write notes in the column and I don't particularly care for my handwriting. And it took me a while to get over it because I didn't want to mess up my Bibles. But I, you know, I said, forget it. I need to I need to read interactively. And what that will help you do is to retain more of the information. You got to know your history. You know, in Judges, it says that the people didn't know the Lord and they didn't know about their ancestors. They forgot about Joshua. They forgot about Moses. They forgot about Abraham. They forgot about all the incredible things that God had done through his people. And because there was a breakdown in the history, they didn't know the Lord. And you've got to know we've got to increase our knowledge. Amen. Second point, unbelief. Turn your Bible back to John chapter 9. Blinded by unbelief. This doesn't, this doesn't define us. Amen. It's just a warning sign. John chapter 9. It says in verse 8, his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging, asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Shalom and wash. So I went and washed. Then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. Unbelief. These neighbors, they just couldn't believe that this guy had undergone such a radical change. They couldn't believe that he had responded in such a way to Jesus's message. They were assessing the situation based on their past experiences with this guy. Like, there's no way this is the same guy. But in reality, when he was sitting on the street begging, they were probably just stepping right over him. You know what I'm talking about? And they weren't really paying attention to him. So when they see him walking around, dressing in his right mind, they think, this, this can't be the same guy. You know, when we do this, we, we assess the situation in our life or we look at people and we think, well, you know, it's already written. There's no way that that person's going to change or there's no way that I'm going to change because you're looking at the track record. You're looking at what happened in the past. That's not faith. Amen. You're actually blinded to God's power because of your unbelief. They weren't able to participate in the, what should have been an incredible celebration. Amen. You know, I know there's some people in the church that, that sometimes we don't even see. 
And sometimes, because we're so busy, we just step right over them. But God is all about opening your eyes and seeing what's before you. And then what happens? People start to raise up. People start to desire to lead for God. Amen. You know, I'm so proud of uh, Mark Perez because he's a guy. I mean, it could be easy to, to just kind of like, you know, a couple months ago, he was a quiet guy. Now, like, man, now he's like fired up. And it could have been easy to say, no, that's just Mark's personality. And I was like, no, it's not. That, that's not, that smile is not, does not tell the whole story. You know, Mark's got that smile. He's just like. <laughs> and I decided I'm going to train Mark. And I said, Mark, stop smiling. That's D time number one. Stop smiling. Look, now look at him. Look at Mark right there. Look at that man right there. Bad man right there. <laughs> you fired up, bro? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, he, 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 you got to see what people can become. Amen. God has a vision. You know, faith that's untested isn't faith at all. Right. That's right. Faith is not faith unless it's tested. God wants you to test him. He's saying, listen, look at all of these promises that I'm laying out before you. Every promise comes with a condition. God says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all things will be given to you. Right. Everything that you need. Until you obey the, the condition, the promise doesn't really mean that much to you. The promise should really, like, if you hear the promise of God, it should, it should excite you. It should invigorate you. You should just be like, wait, you're going to give me everything I need, God? And he's like, yes. And if you don't believe me, ask your neighbor. He's, you saw this come true in your life? You sought the kingdom first. You gave up that job. You gave up that promotion. You gave up that boyfriend, that girlfriend. You gave up that house. You gave up that career, that education. Your family persecuted you. You, you gave all of that up. And they say, yeah. How you doing now? Fired up. I got a better job. I went to a better school. My family stopped persecuting me. They became disciples. Amen. I, What about those friends you left? I know you're, they weren't friends, bro. They were just acquaintances. The only reason we hung out is because we used to get high together, get real. Those people are not your friends. Well, what about your boyfriend or your girlfriend? You kidding me? In the kingdom of God, I got a pure dating relationship. When I got married, we had our first kiss. Are you kidding me? You think I would trade the kingdom for the world? If you're struggling with wanting to go to the world, you simply don't understand the kingdom. You don't understand the kingdom. It's not because somebody hurt you. It's because you, you've lost sight of Jesus Christ. You're spiritually blind due to your unbelief. The call today is to get some faith. Amen? Amen. Faithlessness is trying to control the outcome. You ever been there? Yes. Wow. And what does that create? A lot of worrying and anxiety because you can't control the outcome. Right. You can't control anything. You can't control the weather. You could die today. Are you with me? And you're trying to control your relationships and you're trying to control your husband. You're trying to control your wife, your roommates, your professor, your family. And you can't. And it creates a lot of anxiety. God wants you to be in over your head. Have an idealistic faith. Be, in the world's eyes, a fool. In the world's eyes, be naive. You really think that Jesus is going to come through for you? You don't have to do all of that. Just live your life. Be a good person and go to church on Sundays. There's a lot of people that don't smoke, don't drink, and pay their taxes. Are you with me? That does not make them disciples, guys. To be a disciple, you got to give up everything. You got to follow Jesus Christ. You got to get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Amen. God wants you to have faith. Look at Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, verse 21. I love this passage. It says, From that time Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed on the third day, be raised to life. You know, Jesus knew exactly how, he knew something that nobody else in the world knew. He had an exclusive knowledge of exactly how he was going to die. The Pharisees didn't know it, the disciples didn't understand it, but he knew exactly what was going to happen. 
And that was very challenging. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Uh oh. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. You know, Peter was an emotional guy, you know what I mean? He, he, he didn't, sometimes he just didn't have any breaks. He didn't know when to stop. And he hears Jesus talk about the incredible suffering that he's going to undergo. And then Peter tries to keep him from suffering. You ever been there? Yeah. You know, sometimes as disciples, we want to keep people from suffering or we want to keep people from sacrificing for God that might create suffering. But Jesus says the way is through suffering. Right. And he says, you have in mind the things of, of human beings. You are a worldly person. Wow. You, are, you are terrestrial. You're only about what happens in this life on this earth. As true disciples, we are extraterrestrial. You know what I'm talking about? We're aliens in this world. We're strangers. We're not of this world. We may live in the world, but we're not of this world. And we can't win the world by being worldly. You can't win, you can't like sort of appeal to people's fleshy worldly desires thinking that they're going to become radical sold out disciples. What we do, it doesn't make any sense. It's completely foreign to the world. The world can't recognize it. The world can't understand it. And he says to Peter, you are Satan. <laughs> That's a D time for you right there. Amen. He says, why? Because you're focused only on what you see. And what you feel, you need to have in mind the things of God. It says in verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the son of man is going to come in his father's glory with the angels and, when, and then he'll reward each person according to what they have done. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the son of man coming in his kingdom. Of course, Peter probably thought he was going to die at that point. You know, he's like, man, guys, it's been a good run. Looks like I'm not going to see the kingdom come. <laughs> But Jesus simply says here to lay your life down. When you want something, lay it down. When you desire something, lay it down. When you don't want to obey, lay it down. When you don't want to sacrifice, lay it down. He says you've got to take your life. You've got to lay it down. For the needs of others. You take what you want. And because you love Jesus, you meet the needs of others by laying down your desires. You know, missions is coming up. Amen. Yeah. We've got to give in a way that tests our faith. We've got to give in a way where we understand I'm laying my life down for the needs of of others. We have a goal. Amen. Yeah. We're going to hit that goal. Yeah. But more important than having a goal, we have a God. Amen. And we give because we have a God. Amen. <laughs> we give not because we're called to, but because we want to. We give because we understand what true Christianity is all about. Right. We set aside our desires right. to meet the needs of others. Point number three, religiosity. Go back to John 9. Blinded by religiosity. Verse 13, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he's a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Right here, you see that the Pharisees, they couldn't see because... The way that Jesus healed them didn't fit in their idea of their religion. 
It didn't fit in their theology, so they couldn't quite wrap their minds around it. You ever been there? You ever try to explain discipleship to somebody and they're just like, yeah, but all you got to do is believe. No, that's not true. Well, if you say that, all you, you have to do more than believe, you're, you're preaching a works doctrine. Like, that's also not true. Amen? You can't earn your salvation. You could never, like, get to a point where you feel like, finally, I deserve to be called a disciple. That will never happen. But because you have faith in the message and God has moved your heart, you obey, but that is still your decision. You still decide to obey. God moves. You repent from all your sins and you get baptized for the forgiveness of all those sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But they couldn't understand it. You know what the difference between being religious and being a disciple is? Religious people are independent and they do whatever they feel like doing. Disciples imitate. Amen? <laughs> Disciples are expert imitators. Are you a good imitator? Who are you imitating? Are you a good follower? How's your fellowship this morning? How do you feel about following somebody? How do you feel about, about forgetting what you know and the way that you were raised and how awesome you are and start imitating somebody that has faith? Amen? Amen. They knew Jesus was from God. Even Nicodemus in chapter 3 of John says, we know you're from God. Yeah. There's no way to deny that. All you got to do is look at the miracles, but they refused to admit that he was from God because if they did, then they would have to obey him. Wow. They'd be forced to follow him. Religion wants to improve your life. You know, it's like a community outreach program. And they're not, but it's, it's pretty good. There's a lot of incredible churches. They do incredible things. But more than anything, it's, it's a way to build up the community. They have really no plan to evangelize the world in one generation. We don't get persecuted because we want to go to all nations. Going to all nations is pretty awesome. Crystal and Sean just went to Manila, amen? It's pretty awesome. We don't get persecuted because we baptize. Baptizing people is awesome. You ever been to a boring baptism? No, you haven't. <laughs> Baptisms are fun. Yeah. We get persecuted because we actually expect people to obey. Yeah, that's true. Religion wants to improve your life. Jesus wants you to lose your life. Wow. Jesus isn't like, I got this idea. Just do what you're doing. And let's just like add in like Sunday and Wednesday. You got to come on Wednesday, man. Like, no, 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 no. We're totally sold out radical disciples of Jesus Christ. We're willing to die for Jesus. But it's easy if somebody puts a gun to your, your head and they say, hey, deny Jesus Christ. Never. You know, it's hard to die every day. It's hard to live every day for Jesus Christ. The answer to all of your issues is the cross. Amen. Amen. This is the this is the solution in your marriage. Are you with me? Yeah. But you got any marriage issues? <laughs> this is the solution. Somebody's just got to decide to be like Jesus. Amen. Amen. And when Jesus died on the cross, he's like, all right, looks like I got to go die on the cross. I don't deserve to be up here, but I'm going to take the high road. So I'm a disciple of Jesus. That person doesn't have enough faith to stay on the cross. Amen. If the heat gets hot enough, they'll come down off the cross and settle the score. Like, yeah, forget this whole Christian thing. Like, let you know. The solution. Anybody got any roommate problems? All it takes is one. All it takes is one. Somebody's got to decide to be a Christian. Because when they look at that brother, that sister, that has enough humility to get up on the cross and to take the hit and not announce it, to really take responsibility, everybody, it echoes deep in our chambers. Like, we know. We know. And we see it. And what does it do to us? Humbles us. And like, no, 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 it's not your fault, bro. It's my fault. And then there's like this like cross fest in the household. You're like, no, 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 it's my fault, bro. No, go to bed. I'll wash the dishes, bro. And it's like, whoa, what is going on? When you're not focused on the cross, what does it become? Horrible. It becomes, it becomes devilish. 
becomes satanic. It gets ugly real fast. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody got any uh, financial issues? <laughs> Here's the solution, the cross. Some of us give to God the way we pay taxes. It's like you, you, you pay contribution. It's like a bill for you. But the solution to your financial issues is actually to give to God generously and talk to somebody that does. And they'll tell you, yeah, actually, I didn't raise my hand when I had financial when they asked who has financial issues because I don't because I give to God. But here's the, also, the other truth. You could be totally broke. You could meet financial ruin. As long as you're a disciple, you're good. Yeah. Yeah. The great tragedy in life is not meeting financial ruin. The great tragedy in life is when you or somebody you love doesn't know God. The cross is all that we need. So they don't want to follow Jesus because it would imply too much. So instead of following, they persecute. And when people are met with the truth, they do one of three things. They convert, they run, or they persecute. Where are you at today? If you're studying the Bible, you've been studying the Bible for a while, you need to convert. Because if you don't, you're going to run, and eventually you'll probably become a persecutor. But if you're already a faithful disciple, you need to reconvert and recommit. You've got to get your heart close to the cross because that is the solution for your life. We need to go into all nations. It's not a catchphrase. Amen, guys? We need to go into all nations because we need to save people from false religions and not offer just a watered-down Christianity. Fourth point, and we'll close here, fear. Come on. It says in verse 18, they still did not believe him that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he's our son, the parents answered. We know he was born blind, but how he can see or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he's of age, he'll speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. These people couldn't even own their own son because of fear. And they were blinded to the work of God in their own son's life. Their son is radically healed, radically transformed, fired up, excited, and like, I don't know about this. Because they were afraid. They were afraid of being ostracized. They were afraid of what other people thought about them. They were sentimental. They were people pleasers. And imagine that the son, having been born blind, sees his parents for the first time. I'm sure he probably went to a mirror. He's like, I want to get a good look at myself. Look at you. Hey, not, it's not too bad, I guess. You know, I don't know. You know, he's trying to figure it out. And then he sees mom and dad. And I, I, you got to believe that there's just an emotional moment, you know, that his heart just wells up and he wants to embrace mom and dad. But they're, they're skeptical. You ever seen those videos where, where little deaf children are given an apparatus and for the first time, they hear mom and dad's voice. And even little babies, there's like a mixture of laughter and crying because they're so moved because they see mom and dad for the first time. They hear mom and dad's voice. They're touched deep within their soul. And here this guy turns to mom and dad and all they can think about is themselves. Wow. And they're worried about what people think about them and what the Jews might say. And they don't want to get, they don't want to, you know, they don't want to compromise their standing in society because they, they've got some investments going on. And, you know, it's cool for their son. I don't know, just ask him. Pretty incredible. You know, it reminds us of when we get baptized and we go and we tell people about it and we think that they're going to be fired up. Yeah. You won't believe it. I stopped smoking. Yeah. I stopped drinking. Right. I stopped womanizing. Yeah. I stopped dressing so that guys would give me the type of attention that actually I don't really want, but I'm desperate anyway, so I'll take it. Wow. I, I stopped spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on totally useless junk that's all scheduled to be burned anyways yeah. to try to make myself feel better, give me a false sense of security so that I can like 
try to cover up the fact that I'm actually really weak and really afraid and totally alone and I cry when I lay my head down at night on the pillow. I stopped doing all that. I've confessed all my sin. I've made it right. I fired up. Will you come to church with me? What is wrong with you? I'm very nervous about this development in your life. They told you you need to change? Who told you that? I've been telling you that for 15 years. You've never listened to me. Nobody can tell you, don't stop drinking. You can drink if you want to, son. M Mom, dad, I think you should come to church with me. What? They get the Bible. It hasn't been open in 15 years. I know the Bible, son. <laughs> Daughter, I gave birth to you, Mika. You don't tell me. I tell you. The power of the chancla. You know what it is. In Mexico, they make chancla holsters. They go... <laughs> Different moms have duels. <laughs> how did this, this kid, how did he feel? Horrible. But doesn't waver in his face. It goes on. In verse 24, a second time they summoned the man who had been blind Give glory to God by telling the truth. They said, we know this man's a sinner. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already. You didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? <laughs> Then they hurled insults at him and said, you're this fellow's disciple. We're disciples of Moses. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. He spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth how dare you lecture us and they threw him out <laughs> here's this guy who was a blind beggar never been to school never had a job he just sat on the side of the road with his hand out yet he's in the courtroom with the most powerful and most educated men of the day in Israel and he sorts him out because his faith is so simple. His faith is based on, well, I don't know about all that stuff you're talking about. But here's what I do know. I was blind, and now I see. As a matter of fact, I recognize your voice, Mr. Pharisee man. Don't you live right around the corner from my parents? As a matter of fact, I've heard you saying your prayers every time you stepped right over me. And you never even tried to heal me. Mr. Pharisee man. Yeah, I think I recognize your voice. Here's a guy who in essence is illiterate, yet knows the power of the scriptures and preaches and says, hey, let me turn you into a disciple. We've got to get our faith back, amen? We can't give in to fear, guys. And all of us need to be disciple makers. All of us are called to be personally fruitful. Are you with me? All of us are called by Jesus to the standard. And you know what? Our standard is the ideal. He goes on in verse 35. It says, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? Who is he, sir? The man asked, tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, you've now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment I've come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say it, and asked, what, are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. 
You know, it's incredible because Jesus goes and searches for this guy. He hears about it. He's like, oh, he got kicked out of the synagogue? Hey, maybe we got a disciple. <laughs> he goes, he says, hey, do you believe in the Son of Man? He's like, the guy is so pure-hearted and so simple. He, he's got so much faith. He just says, who is he? Just tell me so that I can believe. That's the heart of a disciple. Yeah. The heart of the disciple isn't looking for loopholes for disobedience. Right. The heart of the disciple isn't looking for the, the back door to say, well, well, you're not the only church. See you later. That's not the heart of a disciple, guys. The heart of the disciple is like, where's the son of man? I want to I wanna believe in him. I want to worship him. And here's the kicker. Jesus says, I am he. And the guy. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so fired up. I was blind, but now I see. You know, our standard in the kingdom of God is the ideal. We're an idealistic bunch of people, aren't we? We believe that everybody needs to be totally committed. Are you with me? Totally committed. It's not about not missing church. It's that you're totally committed to getting the job done. You're totally committed to the mission. Somebody that's totally committed to the mission wants to be at church. It's not a drag. They're like, oh, I gotta go to midweek. You know what I mean? Oh, Bible talk again this Thursday. Can we get a Can we get a week off? Maybe we can just go Sunday to Sunday. Yeah. Wait, you want me to share my faith every day? No, I don't want you to do anything. I just want you to be a disciple. Yeah. I want you to follow the standard. The idealistic standard that we all hold on to. We believe, it's crazy, I know that everybody needs to be evangelistic. Yeah. We got one person's fired up about evangelism today. I want to challenge you today to share your faith today. Not tomorrow, not on Tuesday, today. Find somebody to invite to study the Bible. Are you with me? We believe that everybody should give. Give of their heart. Give of their time. Give of their knowledge. Give of their money. Amen? To build God's kingdom. This is the way we began the movement. The attitude of every disciple, because this is what defines discipleship, to go anywhere, do anything, and give up everything. This is how we began the movement. This is how we'll sustain the movement. And this is how we're going to get the movement into every corner of the world in this generation. You know what we're doing? We're raising up people that are willing to die to maintain the standard. Let's call them standard bearers. If that's your heart, that you're willing to die to maintain the standard, watch out because we're going to send you all over the world. Amen. You know, uh, 10 years ago in 2008, Rachel and I were asked to move to New York City. So we moved to New York City. Amen. And now there's a cranking church there. We've moved in the last 11 years, 17 times, including the moves that we've done within the cities or states that we were at. We lived in Santiago, Chile for two years. We lived in Mexico City for two years. We lived in OC for four months, and we moved twice in those four months. Then we moved to Riverside. Amen. I love Riverside. I love the IE Reach. I'll never forget it. On uh, June 5th, 2016, it was the day Ahanwa was baptized. It was our first service in the IE region. And Adam, you know, Adam Zapeta, you know, he just got engaged on uh, Friday. <laughs> And it reminded me of that service because uh, when he got engaged, he did a dance. And uh, right before he did the dance, he like looked over to the DJ and was like, hit it. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it made me laugh because our first service in the IE, he uh, did it based on a song. The song was by John Legend, if you're out there. You remember that? Yeah. And uh, right before he uh, started the sermon, he looked, looked back at AJ in the back. He was like, hit it, bro. And then AJ hit the song. He was like, a little louder. <laughs> you know? uh, it was such a moving sermon. And I'll never forget it because uh, that led us on an incredible journey. We've moved a lot. You know, look at the scripture in John chapter 3. The Bible says in verse 8, the wind blows, the wind is the spirit, wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, you cannot tell where it is coming from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. If you're born of the spirit, you got to have faith because you don't know the outcome. You don't know where you're going to end up. Amen. Yeah. And you can't try to control the outcome. If you do, you're out of step with the spirit. Amen. You got to let the spirit do its work. You got to let the wind blow. Are you with me? Yeah. The wind is blowing, and it's very exciting because come May 27th, the City of Angels International Christian Church is going to send out the church planting to Columbus, Ohio. Amen? 
And uh, Colton and Mandy are awesome. They've done an incredible job building up OC, and God has uh, chosen. Colton is from Ohio, uh, went to the University of Ohio, so they're going to be literally three three uh, blocks from the University of Ohio. So uh, we're excited to see what God does. But it, it looks like the uh, wind is blowing in our lives again, Rachel and me. And uh, uh, the leadership has asked us to move to OC and take over the leadership of that great region. Amen. <laughs> I know um, uh, most of us know, and it's an exciting thing. The good news is that we'll still be in the same super region. Amen. So it'll be uh, it'll be O C I E in Coachella Valley. So we're still uh, trying to decide whether we're going to keep Desert Eagles or I thought about Desert Seagulls because it's close to the water, but maybe that. <laughs> I'm not really considering that event. <laughs> you might be wondering, well, who's going to lead the Riverside sector? That would be a good question. And the Spirit has raised up a couple of standard bearers, people that are willing to die to maintain the standard, and that's Sean and Crystal, uh, soon to be O'Connor. Amen. Sean and Crystal are incredible. We're super, super proud of both of them. Uh, they're incredible disciples. They're our best friends, uh, partners in the gospel, uh, Timothy and Timothea. And we love them very much. And uh, God has chosen them. Uh, the Kernans have chosen them. We've chosen them to take over the leadership of the IE region. Amen. Uh, it's going to be very exciting. They're going to be at UCR cranking away. Uh, uh, they're going to they're gonna do a great job. And then you say, well, who's going to lead the tomahawk sector? It's a good question. Next week, we'll talk about that in the sermon. You got to come to the new members orientation to find out. They'll tell you after you buy your chili dog. They'll whisper it into your ear. <laughs> But uh, God has chosen uh, Corey, Bautista, and Haley Hasselon to lead the Tomahawk sector, man. And, and this is incredible, guys. I mean, this, the spirit is moving. And the reality is that we're all family. And uh, we all are committed to growing our relationships with God, and we're all committed to growing the church. And this is a job that cannot be done by a few people. Uh, speaking of a few people, uh, I'm taking Mark with me, amen? amen. I told him that if I forget to say your name, raise your hand so he's back there raising his hand. Uh, Mark is an armor bearer. He's a cranking young intern. Uh, he's going to be right there at Cal State. He's, he's, it's quite a sacrifice because he's had to rearrange his, uh, his career plan and everything for his schooling uh, to be able to go to FJC and then uh, transfer into Cal State Fullerton, uh, where we'll be stationed at. Uh, so I'm super proud of Mark. Let's give it up for Brother Mark right there. And um, uh, so there, there may be a couple of other surprises, uh, but that'll be it for today. And um, but the, the reality is, guys, we need everybody right. to really step up. Uh, it's not time to pull your heart back. Inevitably, some will do that. Um, but we need to decide to, to throw in all together. Yeah. Say, hey, this is this is my church. God has called me to this great task, to building up his kingdom. Sean is really going to need your support. Amen. Amen. Crystal's, Crystal's really going to need your support. Corey and Haley are really going to need your support. Amen. And, and nobody's better than anybody because all of us are disciples. But to those that have been called to lead, he, judged us, he judges us even more strictly. But all of us are called to lead because all of us are followers of Jesus, the greatest leader to ever live. We've got to open our eyes, guys. We've got to be able to see what God wants us to see and not be spiritually blind by ignorance, unbelief, religiosity, or fear. Let's give glory to God. Let's get our hearts completely behind it. Our last service is May 20th, which is Mission Sunday. Amen. Amen. So let's make sure we come through so I can uh, uh, ride off into the sunset on my steed with my incredible wife. 
to OC. I love you guys very much. To God be the glory.